Welcome to IVF This, episode 36, Toxic People. Welcome to IVF This. I'm your host, Emily Ginn. I'm a mother to two beautiful and feral boys. I'm married to my favorite person in the world. I'm a social worker, a life coach, and an IVF warrior. I'm here to teach you how to manage your mind and emotions during your IVF journey, to break free from anxiety and regain control of your life, even in the midst of infertility. I'm going to teach you to say IVF this to how we think about, talk about, and experience infertility. Let's go. Hello, my friends. So excited to talk to you about this topic because it is something that I coach on regularly, but I also see it a lot on the infertility and IVF forums. Now, before I do, I want to take a quick moment to remind everyone that I have a free mini class that I offer. It's called Three Steps to Managing Your Anxiety. It's a 15-minute video that you can get instant access to from my website, www.ivfthiscoaching.com. On the homepage, about halfway down, is the section where you can add your email and name, and the video link is emailed to you. This is the framework that I use all the time with my clients. This is how I teach you to change your relationship with anxiety. Now, why do I say it like that? Some of you might be asking. Also thinking, I don't want to change my relationship with it, Em. I want to get rid of the damn feeling. Look, the reason that I say change your relationship is because you cannot get rid of anxiety completely. It is a primal emotion that has kept us alive and safe throughout the entirety of our evolution. It is a necessary emotion. It's why we don't walk up to the edge of a cliff and just like walk the hell off. We need anxiety to provide us that heightened focus, that heightened awareness of our surroundings. When we change our relationship with anxiety, then it no longer controls us. So many of us walk around with this feeling of being at anxiety's mercy, like we don't have control over our own body. But that's not necessarily anxiety. More often than not, it's our resistance to anxiety that creates that overwhelming experience. Now, I'm not suggesting that anxiety feels awesome in our bodies. No, 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 no. It is quite uncomfortable. I am experiencing anxiety as I write and record this episode with our transfer coming up. In fact, the day this episode is released, because I record a couple of weeks in advance, mostly, The day this is released, hubby and I will be at our amazing clinic for a fertility, transferring our very last embryo for our very last cycle. I have lots of thoughts about this transfer, and I'm doing a lot of self-coaching around it, like what it would mean if it fails, what it would mean if we achieve a pregnancy, what it would be like to be pregnant again, what it would be like to mourn another transfer and the end of this kind of family building phase of our lives. The anxiety is real, y'all. Oh my. (laughs) If you didn't already know I was from Texas, that probably just sealed the deal for you. Anyway, a big part of my self-coaching process is allowing for that anxiety, processing it, allowing for it to be there, even though it is uncomfortable as hell. I remind myself that feeling anxiety is not a problem. I don't have to shame myself for anxiety. I'm feeling anxiety because I'm having a lot of anxiety producing thoughts. I remind myself that I am safe when I experience anxiety. And these are all the things that I teach my clients. So take the 15 minutes, learn the basic kind of beginner steps on how to change your relationship with anxiety. Listen to the feel better now podcast episode where I teach you how to allow for and process emotions. And if you want to go deeper with that, schedule a mini session with me. 30 minutes, completely complimentary. Processing an emotion is probably one of the most common things that we do on those mini session calls. Again, you can find the anxiety course on my website, www.ivfthiscoaching.com. So strongly encourage you to check it out. I also want to mention this because I've gotten a few DMs on Instagram about this, but my coaching is not limited to the States. Yes, that is where I'm based, but I can coach anyone anywhere. I have and have had 
several international clients, time zones can be a bit tricky. So if you're wanting to schedule a mini session or a consult and the only time zones you see is like 2 a.m. your time or something, send me an email at hello at ivfthiscoaching.com. Let me know that you're having some trouble finding some time and we'll make it work. I don't want something like that to keep you from getting the help you're wanting. Okay, let's tackle today's topic, toxic people. Now that is such a huge buzzword and has grown in prominence over the last several years. You hear it all the time, right? Toxic people, toxic relationships, toxic workplaces, all the toxicity, right? I'm certain any of you have heard that term and most likely have used it in some capacity. It's very much a term from what I would call the pseudo empowerment movement that we've seen over the past decade. Now, before I get started, I want to remind you that you always have the option of thinking whatever you want. It is your life and your brain. My job is kind of twofold for this podcast. Number one, it's to help educate you as to why your brain does certain things. Oftentimes, because we are never taught about feelings and thoughts, we tend to turn those things against ourselves and we villainize our brain and our thoughts and our feelings when really our brain is doing exactly what it was designed to do. So I believe that creating awareness around these things is one of my primary responsibilities within this community. Number two, it is to give you a different way to think about things that many of us have just accepted because it's our culture and social messaging. So in this episode, I hope I'm going to do both. What sparked this episode was several people that I have interacted with over the last several weeks and their conversations about the toxic people in their lives. One person talked about how her sister-in-law is toxic because of some of the things that she has said and done to her. Things around comments about infertility, having children, etc. And then there have been some behaviors around leaving her out, the person that I'm talking to, out of things, talking to other people about that couple's infertility struggles behind their backs, her sister-in-law announcing her pregnancy when the family was out celebrating my client's wedding anniversary, while knowing that they were about to start IVF. Another example from a recent mini session I had was from a workplace and how coworkers would make what my client perceived as snide comments about doing IVF. This coworker is a devout Catholic, and the official position of the church is that they do not approve of really any assistive reproductive technology that interferes with the physical act of sex between man and wife to procreate. Now, it's one of the viewpoints of the church. There are a few others, but that's the most pertinent to this conversation. My client's perception of this continued interaction was that this person was toxic and the workplace was also toxic. Those are just a few examples because I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm certain that there are numerous examples both within the context of infertility and just in everyday life that we've all experienced. The scenario isn't what is important. However, it's everything that is happening in your brain. So firstly, I'm going to go ahead and burst the collective bubble in that there is no toxic people. People cannot be toxic. Toxins are defined as a poison or venom, and people are not poisonous or venomous. People cannot be toxic. Unless they're radiating poison, they cannot be toxic. Now, I've had many people argue with me about this, which is totally fine. I love it. People have said, yeah, but have you ever been around someone that just makes you feel terrible? Like they get on you and now you feel whatever, X, Y, Z. Firstly, I say, yeah, I know what that feels like. But no, ever since I found coaching, I don't believe that. When you believe that someone can impact you, that someone is toxic, then you have handed all of your power over to them. You've handed over your emotional and mental wellness to that individual. I don't ever want someone else to have more power over me than I have over myself. It's like being around a poisonous spider. You can be in that spider's presence and not get poisoned. The spider would have to bite you for you to be poisoned. So unless that person is actually injecting you with poison, then their presence is not toxic. Again, I think so much of this goes back to the pseudo empowerment movement that we've seen that we have this messaging that people or situations can be toxic, which based on the fact that we're not taught about our thoughts and feelings, which makes sense as to why this BS is so believable, right? We're not taught that we are in charge of our thoughts and feelings. 
which is something I go into in depth in an upcoming episode. So it makes sense why this idea of toxic people in situations has been so readily accepted. So if we don't have toxic people, like if there is no toxic person or toxic situation, then what do we have? We have people in situations with whom and where we get triggered because of our own thinking. They trigger you to have thoughts. There are people that act in a way that trigger you to think, feel, and act in certain ways. There are people who bring out the worst in you or who you believe bring out the worst in you by how you think about them and yourself when you're around them. My bestie used to work at this firm. This was a while ago and it was kind of a transition job where she used to talk about how toxic the environment was. Her boss, who admittedly is not a great manager, and I know that's just my thought, but she's my ride or die. Basically, what happened was that the boss and some of her coworkers, and it seemed like almost the company culture was to hyper-focus on the shortcomings of the staff. I know that this is a very common thing, and they'll disguise it often as, here are your quote-unquote opportunities, which is the same shit, right? Anyway, she felt like her boss was constantly telling her that she was not doing enough, that her product was suboptimal, that she wasn't a team player, all of these things, right? So she felt her boss and her workplace were very toxic. But really what was happening is that this boss and that culture was triggering all of the unconscious and some conscious belief systems that she already had about herself. In her mind, and we had talked about this, the things that her boss said to her about her, in her mind, confirmed the worst things that she already believed about herself. That's why it was so powerful. It's not that her boss was saying things to her. It was that she agreed on some level. It was that she cared more about what her boss thought of her than how she cared about how she thought about her. For my client that was talking about her sister-in-law and being toxic, the reason that her sister-in-law is viewed that way is because the things that she says and does trigger thoughts in my clients. Now, I'm not going to debate the appropriateness of these things ever. That's not for me to judge. We just want to make sure that we are really clean about what's happening. There are people that we don't like, and that's okay. It's totally fine. We get to choose who we want and don't want in our lives. But what I want to offer you is that when you start to take ownership of your thoughts and truly realizing that no one is toxic, that someone can be around you and it not affect you at all, you can make room for some of those people in your life. Because we have this belief that there are toxic people, we think that we have to remove these people or change the circumstances of our lives. But if I've convinced you that there's no such thing as a toxic person or a toxic situation, then what will you do with these people? These people who trigger you, these people who trigger negative thoughts in you, these people who will cross your boundaries, these people who you are challenged when you are around them. First and foremost, I want to remind you of a couple of things. People are allowed to do and say whatever they want. Now, there are consequences for everyone, for our actions, but people are allowed to behave however they choose. I know that this is hard for many of us, including myself. People do not have to follow rules. For me, for instance, I tend to speed when I'm driving. I know the law. I can clearly see the speed limit signs. I understand that I can get a ticket for speeding, and yet sometimes I still speed. A speed limit is a rule, and I still choose to break that rule. People are allowed to cheat. People are allowed to lie. People are allowed to say things. We're all human. We all have free will, and we're all allowed to do what we want. The second thing is that you get to choose who you want to spend time with. You get to decide. Always. You are always in charge of who you spend time with. You do not have to spend time with anyone you don't want to spend time with. Just like your reasons for that decision. And it's not because they're toxic. They don't have any power over you. It is because it is your conscious and deliberate choice. This goes for anyone. Friends, parents, siblings, extended family, children, coworkers, anyone. If you are spending time with anyone, it is because it is your choice. Remember, number one is people are allowed to behave the way they want to behave, period. There's nothing you can do about it. Number two, 
you get to choose who you want to spend time with. And number three, the thing that I want you to know is that you don't have to take responsibility for how other people behave or for their feelings. That's not your job, but you do, I highly recommend, take responsibility for how you behave. I noticed that it is harder for me to behave around certain people. I have this ideal for who I want to be. When I'm around certain people, I find myself not being that person, not being kind, not being respectful. I find myself raising my voice and blaming another person for how I'm behaving, but it's never their fault for how I'm behaving. They are allowed to behave how they want to behave. I am taking personal responsibility for my behavior. So if someone is rude to me, it is not their fault if I am rude back. That's on me. If someone raises their voice to me, I can't take responsibility for that. But if I raise my voice back, then I do need to take responsibility for that. I need to take responsibility for how I behave. If someone comes at me and is disrespectful, and then I'm disrespectful back, that's on me. It is never their responsibility for how I behave. This is so important to remember. If you think someone is toxic and you think their behavior is unacceptable, and then you behave in an unacceptable way, a way that does not align with the person that you want to be, maybe you're being passive aggressive or gossiping or being rude back to them, whatever, but you're justifying your behavior because of the way they are acting, then you have convinced yourself that they have more power over you and that they can control how you behave. It's never them. If you're with someone and you find yourself behaving in a way that you don't like or a behavior that mirrors their behavior, the behavior that you find to be toxic, the answer isn't simply to remove that person from your life because it's an opportunity to work on yourself, to develop boundaries, to take back control and to take back your power. Here's my suggestion. You decide whether or not you wanna spend time with someone. You own that choice and you make sure you like your reasons for not spending time with them. Notice if the reason is they're toxic, you're saying they're too powerful. I can't behave myself when I'm around them. I can't control my emotions when I'm around them. I feel awful around them. Notice that they are not responsible for how you feel, so you can't give them credit for causing your feelings. If you want to say it's too much work to be around them, it's hard for me to feel good around them. I don't know how much thought work I have to do around them. That's why I'm choosing to not be around them. That's another thing. Here's an example I used with one of my clients when she was talking about not getting along with her brother-in-law. Her sister and her, she considered to be very close, but did not get along with her brother-in-law. She felt like he was mean to her. He would say, in her words, snide things just to get at me. So she took it all very personally and stopped spending as much time with her sister as she had had previously spent. They lived in the same town and they were used to spending time with each other several times a week. She was blaming her brother-in-law for missing time with her sister. So I asked her if every time she was around her sister and her sister had a dog that was very mean to her, growled at her all the time, barked at her, and tried to keep her away from her sister, would that prevent her from spending time? She said, no, I wouldn't let it bother me. It'd be a little annoying, but I wouldn't take it personally. Now, I'm not comparing her brother-in-law to a dog, but rather drawing a parallel that the dog behaves the way they behave. People behave the way they behave. Everyone and everything is allowed to behave the way they behave. This was really powerful for her because she was blaming her brother-in-law for not getting to spend time with her sister because she was making him responsible for her feelings. And she did not like that reason. Ultimately, she could still decide that she doesn't want to spend time with her sister because it requires her to do a lot of conscious thought work around her relationship with her brother-in-law, and she might like that reason. For me, when I'm going to spend time with someone that I know historically might trigger me to having negative thoughts, first, I own that it's my own thinking that is creating that emotion, right? The think, feel, do cycle I talk about. Then I do my work before, during, and after I spend time with them. That does not mean that I don't get annoyed or something. Absolutely not. I still experience all of the same emotions, but I don't give that person that credit. This isn't a group project. It's just me. I am in charge of what I think, feel, and do always. 
No one is powerful enough to create a thought or feeling within me. Don't ever let anyone have that kind of power over you. If you need some help with this, maybe there's a really challenging relationship in your life that you think we could work on, book a mini session with me and we can start working on it right away. Okay, this is what I have for you today, my friends. Have a beautiful week and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of IVF This. If you like what you've heard, click subscribe and follow to make sure you don't miss an episode. And if you want to learn more, head over to www.ivfthiscoaching.com to learn how to work together.